Good morning and welcome to the Little Home Church by the Wayside. This is the second Sunday in Advent or in Lent, and for all um, of the Sundays of Lent, we're, we are exploring the history of communion through the ages. Today, our focus will be on the Middle Ages and the Renaissance Church. Included in your bulletin, and this includes the bulletin online, you will find notes on the church history, on visual arts, and music. Today, for the visual arts, Emma created a game for you. Instead of Where's Waldo, it's Where's Judas. So um, I urge you to take those bulletins home and really, really learn a little bit more about the church history as, and, and even more than what uh, you take away from the service today. Um, so we're taking communion every uh, Sunday as well. And last week we had a bread called Ezekiel bread that Rick Alex baked. Many of you asked for the recipe and Rick is uh, working on getting that to us. And today the bread that we have is um, a recipe from Hildegard von Bingen from the Middle Ages. And the boys and girls are going to learn a little bit more about Hildegard in a little bit. And we want to thank Claudine Myers for baking that for us today. We welcome everyone to the service, those watching online from near and far. We're an open and affirming church. Everyone is welcome here regardless of race, sexuality, or any other perceived differences. You can always find a place here at our table. Please fill out a visitor's card if you're visiting today. And if you're watching online, reach out to us by email. I want to thank Kit for being our pulpit associate. Andrea and Carol are our ushers. The flowers are provided by Grace today and fellowship by the Miller family. Coming up this week, sis, after fellowship today, they'll be meeting. And then this week on Thursday, we have uh, our contemplative services at 8 in the morning and 7 at night. Wednesday is Bible study at 10 o'clock. You can come to the pastor's office or join us on Zoom. Next Saturday, we'll have our second walk and talk. They're just going to be every Saturday, and it's for whoever shows up in the courtyard at 930. 
and you can walk according to your various paces and things. You'll find a group that's simpatico with you. We had a group of 10 folks yesterday and actually the weather in the morning was really quite lovely. And so um, we encourage everybody to do that. Um, March 12th, next Sunday is daylight savings time. And after church, we will have the all church book read. We're going to do our first meeting at Dunham Woods Riding Club. Um, and if you could get reservations into the church office by Thursday, we'll meet there at 1130. And, um, the general cost of a, um, of a breakfast there is, uh, it's not a buffet. It's just a, an a la carte is around, um, 12 to $15, you know, and things. So, and with some coffee, just kind of plan on maybe a $20 meal ticket for the day. March 13th, plant orders are due. March 24th, we have another game night coming up on a Friday. And March 25th, Spring Clean Day, which Spring Clean Day will include both inside and outside uh, activities to do. And then the last date um, that I have to give you is on March 26th, we're going to gather at Carol Berger's house. This is what we call a meet and greet for prospective new members. And um, Carol makes her own pizza and so we're going to have a pizza night and so we invite i know um we'll be reaching out to folks who have been visiting and so on but we don't want to miss anybody so please let it, uh carol know if you're interested in attending pizza night at the meet and greet on march 26th and then uh andrea are you close with the microphone so so um as andrea is getting the microphone i'll just get us uh, a little start on the pitch we were assigned our new we were assigned our new family and it is a family from syria and as you know they've just gone through you know terrible earthquake and so on but it's a large family and andrea's going to tell you about that now so take they're, it away uh, they're coming from turkey and oh, they turkey. come in, no they're syrian oh, okay. but they've been in turkey which i'm not sure that's better <laughs> <laughs> but and they're coming in on the 14th and so we're going to do uh, hopefully tentatively the move in on Sunday afternoon leaving here about two so if anybody wants to join that'd be great and thanks to so many generous people we have everything except we need a fan and there are it's two adults and seven children so we need queen size sheets and comforter one and then seven same thing sheets and comforter for the children. So if anybody can help there, please let me know everything else. And then we'll do the grocery shopping before the 12th too. So we're excited to be able to help. Yeah, yeah the twin sets are the seven for the children. Right. This month. It's originally, and uh, you know, we were thinking we were going to do it next month, but this is a, for Exodus, this is a crisis situation. The family moves into the unit on March, four, Tuesday, March 14th, and our availability was March 12th to move in. And if anybody can offer to help move in um, as well, you'll, you'll be, you know, make, making beds. It's, we're going to leave here at two o'clock. So we'll have, you know, book club and then, you know, have a chance to get down. Yeah, here. and if anybody can help with um, sheets and a van, um, let me know. All right. Thank you. It's a great opportunity and we appreciate so much again the outreach of the church. I have one note to read to you guys and um, it's from Ruth. And I'll just read it the way she, she wrote it. Please know that Ruth Lishimer is grateful for beautiful flowers. Um, that dear congregation members bring after church services. So kind of LHC and Jean and Frank Muno this past Sunday. I so miss our blessed church services, but because I'm in a wheelchair bound, um, I can't travel uh, in an automobile because of my uh, twisted leg. I would have surgery, but it's impossible at 98 years old. I dearly love our precious church and congregation. How good to see the service on laptop afterwards. Pastor Larry, you are, f oh, we'll skip that. And then uh, <laughs> you are, you are fabulous. Hope you had a pleasant and much deserved birthday. Think Ruth. Thank you also for home visits and prayers. Uh, thank you all also for um, prayers for Sun Lee, who is in cancer remission at this point. Uh, God bless. Love, Ruth.
So um, that's a really wonderful thing. Good work on everybody's part for um, helping Ruth. Is there any other announcements? Do, do we have? Oh, Clara. Um, there's. This is another day to order Girl Scout cookies, and you can also, um, if you ordered them uh, like last week or the week before that, you can pick up your Girl Scout cookies at Fellowship. All right. Thank you. Anybody else for an announcement? All right. I'd ask you to just close your eyes for a second, take in a few deep breaths. As we find ourselves in this time of Lent, of soul searching, wanting to become closer to God, let us come together in communion today. Today, as we spend time learning about church history in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, hear these words of William Shakespeare. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the day the night, thou canst not then be false to any man. Our, in our instincts are usually to play to the approval of others. Validation from others is often the most important validation that many of us seek. It's a tremendous ego booster. What we often forget is that self-examination is much more critical than the critique of others. We must always live with ourselves. And if our lives are to be enhanced by any decent degree of personal peace, we must even come to like ourselves. In this service, may we do the tough work of self-examination, the intense work of self-reflection, the sobering work of self-critique, knowing we are in the presence of a God who loves us, created us, and is in us, and leave here loving our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. From the safety and comfort of home, God called Abram to go from all he knew to embrace a future yet to be revealed. Go from, God says, and our hesitant hearts place one foot in front of the other to trust God with the unknown. By night, Nicodemus came seeking greater insight into the teachings of God for the journey set before him. Jesus called him out of the shadows and towards a life born anew. Go towards, God says, and a new life awaits us. We reach towards a God who has not come to condemn the world, but to offer a Sabbath. We fear the unknown, and that which we lack is understanding. How can this be, we proclaim with Nicodemus, and yet God's call is one that urges us to go with our whole self into that unknowing, trusting that God will provide a way. Love calls us forth into lives of transformation, born anew into new paths, though we do not know where we are going. God has promised to never leave us alone. Let us worship the one who will show us the way.
please join me in the prayer of invocation. God of calls and courage, you draw us towards your loving embrace, even as we face what seems like impossibility. We experience heartache and grief, injustice and cruelty, fear and anxiety as daily teachers on this path of faith. As you call us to go into an uncertain and unknown future, oh, grant us the courage needed to let go of all that we have known so that we can take hold of the new life you are bringing about even now. Though we may not know where we are going, your way is revealed moment by moment, step by step, and breath by breath. In the name of the one who so loves the world, we pray. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for transformation and new life. O oh God, we all too often wish to go our own way, maintain control, and rely on our own strength rather than trust that you will provide. Forgive us in an, our unwillingness to live by faith or to not trust you with providing all that we need for the journey. May God's mercy surround our weaknesses with grace for restoring us to hope everlasting. Hear these words of grace. Friends, the call of God does not leave us isolated and condemned on a road of uncertainty, fear, and mistakes made. God's unending love and compassion is for all whose burdens are heavy and whose weary journey brings tears. May the tender arms of God carry you forth in strength. God has not come to them, but to look for healing burdens. We welcome God's healing and salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. This is where we stand and place our hands on our heart and greet your friends. And I'll ask if the boys and girls will start to come forward. We'll talk. We're going to talk about that. Come on up. Hi, Madden. So, Clara. Um, why don't you just ask what you just asked? Is that a brownie? So the communion bread looks a little darker than that. We're going to talk. That's a great leading question to today. So do you remember what Lent, what Lent stood for last week when I, when we talked about Lent? Anybody remember the... Something about light. There's a light inside us, but what about the light outside? What starts to happen in the springtime? There's there's clouds and things, but what? It gets lighter earlier. It's the Lent is the lengthening of days. Now it doesn't again mean more than 24 hours. Just 24. Just we still get that, but we have more light in the day. And next week particularly is daylight savings time, so you're going to be getting up an hour early. It's that spring ahead kind of idea. There's something else as we think about calendars. This month in the United States is what we call Women's Month. And so we start to think of all the contributions that women have made to our society and things. And the reason, Clara, your question was so important is because Mrs. Myers baked this bread, which, um, so it's not brownies, it's, it's bread, and it's actually kind of a sweet bread. 
Um, and maybe later, when you go home, and if you take your bulletin home, your moms and dads can read about the bread to you. But it's, it has different spices in it. So the, so the recipe comes from a woman who was born in 1098. That's a long time ago. And her name was Hildegard of Bingen. She was German, and she did a lot of writing. She composed music, and she was a mystic. She had visions. She became an abbess, which is a nun, for a monastery. And she also wrote about medical and scientific things. And she wrote many of her letters to politicians of the day. Now, um, she couldn't be a leader in the church service at that time because women weren't allowed to be part of that. Uh, Erin. The, the monarchies, I think, is what, when, when, when we say that. I think it was to the monarchies and things. That's a good point. Hildegard, she was actually born into a noble family herself. She was the tenth child in the family, and her family gave her to the monastery, and she became a nun at 15. By, thir the, uh, by the age 38, she was titled uh, Mother Superior, and her monastery was in the Rhine Valley, near Bingen, and hence Hildegard from Bingen. She traveled a lot, she talked to a lot of people, and after she died, a lot of the popes suggested that she become a saint, but this didn't happen. However, she does have a feast day, which is September 17th, which is uh, the day in the calendar that she died. St. Patrick's Day is on the 17th of March, that's coming up. She had many visions, um, she wrote them down. They were mostly about God and God's relationship and love with humans and the church and creation. Her music that she wrote wasn't like the other music of the day. It was a little more melodic. There was something that you could sing a little bit more of. And her music was also written for higher voices because she was in, um, she was, she was in the abbey with um, all the women and women have higher voices than men. Erin, do you have something you want to share? She, um, that's a good question. And we talked about that last week in the service, that pre-1400, there wasn't a lot of music in the service. She just knew how to write music, and it might have been one of her gifts that she got. And so she would write music, and she even would sometimes put in some little harmonies with that. So that's a good point. It's a very good point. So, yes, Madden. How did she get to the Abbey? Her parents took her there, and then it became her home, and she lived with all of the other nuns and dedicated herself to, to helping and serving others and, um, and sharing God's love with them, which is what we always want to do, right? Right. So you guys, in just a second, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. But what I want you to, to think about again is in our history, particularly for the girls here today, We've come a long way, baby. And so you can have places to serve in the church. And you don't just have to be over in an abbey or something. You can serve God any place that you want. And you have a voice. And that's really, really, really important. All right? When I look at our church council meeting we just had, um, last week I was the only, I think I was the only man there. And... Um, and, and everybody was doing their part. All the women were doing their part to represent the church and serve God. So that's really important. But Aaron, boys can do it too. And, and Heath, all right? All right, we all, can, we all can serve God. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. You guys will go to Sunday school and then come back for communion. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, off you go. So continuing in that spirit of prayer, um, joys and concerns, I'll get us started. Janice Christensen officially went into uh, hospice this week. They've moved into her home, and um, we want to keep her in our prayers. We want to keep Ron and Maggie continually in our prayers. Carly, uh, Kit, we're very sorry. Um, we've been praying for Stephanie, knowing where the outcome was going to be, but she did have sort of a little, um, just a, a wonderful moment before uh, her passing, but she did die this week at 26 years old. And um, are there any other joys and concerns up here? Prayers for my friend Susan and Peter Rayula. I've told you before, Peter has ALS, but recently was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer on top of ALS. And they are trying to find a hospice organization that they can work with. And um, my friend George, who had, um, had a cancer of the liver, which was stage four, did pass away. Uh, prayers for his family. And then Anne McLaughlin. Actually, I have a cancer joy. Um, our congregation has prayed for my friend Ron, and he had some follow-up tests, and the cancer in his lungs has improved. So he will be continuing on immunotherapy, so I would ask you to continue praying for Ron as well as my brother-in-law, Tommy. A joy. Uh, Faye is 18 today, and last week made the varsity soccer team. Wonderful. Anyone else? Okay, please join me in prayer. Oh, wait, one more? Sorry. Sam oh, it's Samantha. <laughs> um, just prayers for my grandpa on my dad's side. He's been having some health issues. Um, so we're kind of waiting for what's to come from that. And then the uh, former deputy chief of the Geneva Fire Department's been battling cancer for the last seven, eight months. Um, and they let us know this week that there's no more treatment options. So they're kind of we're okay. um, working through that as a department. So, Okay. What is his name? Mark. Mark. And your grandpa's name? Ray. Ray. Anyone else? Okay. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, as we journey into this Lenten season, we pray for those who are being tempted, tempted to look the other way when wrong is happening in their family, their workplace, their neighborhoods, tempted to misuse their gifts for self-gratifying purposes, tempted to allow untamed emotions to direct or do harm, tempted by the corrupting power of money, and those tempted to stay in a rut rather than strike out on new life-giving paths. We pray for the many who feel pushed and tested almost beyond their endurance, those in positions of heavy responsibility who feel overloaded, or those pressured from all sides by factions in workplace or community, suffering people, and all those who must watch a loved one suffer who feel they can bear no more, kindly folk whose patience with a difficult friend is at a breaking point, those whose faith seems stretched beyond their limit, the depressed and despairing whose inner being cries out for relief. And we also pray for those whose days are sunny and bright, the happy, that their happiness may always be used for goodwill and compassion, the strong, that their energies may be used wisely and gently. For the rich, that their wealth may be shared generously. For the powerful, that they may use their position as a blessing. And those of strong faith, that they may act justly, love mercy, 
and walk humbly with you. Righteous God, walk with us and shape us, God of compassion. We also pray for each other, for our households of faith this week, for those awaiting test results or appointments, surgeries, those recovering from surgery. We pray with those who grieve and those walking with loved ones through the valley of the shadow of death. We pray for those whose burden is light and for those whose burden is heavy. Bring relief, we pray. God, we lift up Janice and her family as she goes into these final days of her life on earth. The same for Peter and his family. For those with difficulties in recovery of health, for Ron and Maggie, Carly. Be with Tom and Mary Fleischman as Mary recovers. And we're thankful for the good reports we're receiving about her health. Be with the family of George who passed away. Thankful for Ron's good news. Be with Tommy's family as he goes through his cancer treatments. Thankful for the life of Faye. God be with Ray. Be with the family of Mark as again they go through their final days together. We pray all of this in the many and holy names of God, knowing you are hearing us far better than we are speaking. Amen. Our first reading today is from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Our second reading is from John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. For the word in Scripture, for the word among us, for the word within us. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
I'd like to begin this morning by looking back at what we discussed last week, communion in the early Christian church. Briefly, we adopted a working definition of communion as an act or time of sharing in intimate fellowship. We then looked at the progression of communion from the Last Supper to agape feasts to a very formal celebration of the Eucharist. As communion became formalized as Holy Communion, the intimate fellowship of the Last Supper and the sharing of a common meal with a group of believers gave way to a very formalized celebration of the Eucharist in which Jesus' words were recalled, this is my body, this is my blood. A priest officiated at a ceremony in which members of a church congregation watched as the priest celebrated communion on behalf of the church members. The act or time of sharing an intimate fellowship gave way to the Catholic Mass, which further separated the priest from the congregation. The fellowship did not center on receiving bread and wine, but on watching the priest at the altar. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the West in Rome and the East in Constantinople were in turmoil. The Crusades spanned the years 1095 to 1291, bringing more of the West and the East into controversies affecting almost all societal norms. The Great Schism between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church would forever define the two major divisions of, Christ of the Christian Church in Western Europe and the Middle East. Then in 1571, the Reformation began when Martin Luther made his views known concerning the excesses of the Roman Catholic Church by nailing his 95 Thesis to the church door in Wittenberg. I tell you all of this to give you a context for the debate, excuse me, for the debates that were simmering and eventually boiled over concerning Holy Communion. And while this isn't a historical presentation about the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, some historical context is helpful to know to understand the debates and challenges of theological positions concerning communion and Holy Communion and Eucharist. The issue that caused so much controversy in Christendom all stemmed from the Last Supper when Jesus uttered his words, this is my body, this is my blood. The Holy Roman Catholic Church, headquartered in Rome, set all the policies and procedures for Christians to follow. Communion came down to two words, transubstantiation and consubstantiation. The Roman Catholic Church took the position that the bread and wine used in the Eucharist was the actual body and blood of Jesus. The church somehow had to take ordinary bread and wine and transform it into the real body and blood of Christ. This change was known as the doctrine of tra transubstantiation. The ordinary bread and wine at the altar became the actual body and blood of Jesus through the consecration of those elements by a priest. At first, the laity did not take a part at all in the Eucharist, but later in history, fully baptized church members could receive the host, the consecrated actual body of Christ, but they were not allowed access to the cup until more modern times. Most Christian churches accepted the concept of transubstantiation. Your bulletin notes will guide you through some of the important dates and events that help shape the practice of taking ordinary bread and wine, such as we have up here, and making them be for us the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, the other term that was floating around was consubstantiation, which gained more and more acceptance during the Renaissance, and especially after 1517 and the beginning of the Reformation of Martin Luther. Luther never completely left the position of the Catholic Church that ordinary bread and ordinary wine would and could become the body and blood of Christ during the Eucharist. Luther and others offered the theory of consubstantiation, in which the substance of the ordinary bread and wine coexisted along with the body and blood of Christ in the consecrated bread and wine presided over by the, by the priest. The bread and wine did not change their true nature. They still were bread and wine, but they existed along the actual body and blood found in the consecrated elements that the priest had, had handled. 
So as the Re Reformation was heating up and Protestants were increasing in number, having to believe that the bread and wine became the actual body and blood of Christ ceased to be an all-consuming issue, even for the Protestant churches. Bread and wine could be offered to all, and Jesus' words at the Last Supper were remembered so that communion could become again an act or time of sharing an intimate fellowship without the confusion of eating the body and blood and drink, uh, without eating the body and, of Jesus and drinking his blood. I want to backtrack for just a minute to the great schism of 1054 in which the church in Rome and the church in Constantinople split. There were some issues of church governance, certainly, and the role of the Pope in uh, in Rome as the head of all Christian churches, but a big part of the split between the two churches had to deal with two issues related to the practice of Holy Communion. First, Roman Catholics believe that Jesus' being was begotten or flowed directly from God. Jesus' body was transformed into the bread by the words of institution spoken by the priest. The Orthodox Church, with its center in Constantinople, believe the bread and wine were changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, which flowed directly from God to the communion elements. For the Orthodox Church, it was the Holy Spirit that transformed the communion elements into the body and blood of Christ, not the priest's words. This disagreement had to do with the decisions made at the Council of Chalcedon 600 years before the Great Schism. Now, if I had enough time this morning, I could have discussed the Council's findings, chief of which was the general acceptance up to the schism of the Nicene Creed, which is one of the creeds that, that are said in many churches, along with the Apostles' Creed. Two other issues led to the schism. One, the Orthodox Church, this is amazing to me, the, the Orthodox Church did not believe the bread used in communion should be unleavened bread. They believed the use of unleavened bread was a return to the practice of using unleavened bread, the practice used by the Jews, and they didn't want any part of that. The Orthodox Church would only use leavened bread, such as we use in today's communion. Leavened versus unleavened bread was a deal breaker for the Orthodox Church. Because the Orthodox Church and its patriarch were challenging the Pope's role as the head of all Christian churches everywhere, the Pope excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople, and the Great Schism began. To this day, the Christian Church in Europe and the Middle Ages are split. The Roman Catholic Church overseen by the Pope in Rome, and the Eastern Orthodox Church overseen by various leaders based on geographic and political boundaries. Two last bits of history, and then I will show how all this has to do with the celebration of communion during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. In 1545 to 1563, the Council of Trent met to discuss, among other issues, how communion would be celebrated. At that council, it was agreed upon that there would be only one way to celebrate the Eucharist, and that Christ was entirely present in the communion elements. Until the full effects of the Reformation and the rise of Protestant churches occurred in the years after the council, for a moment, after the Council of Trent, Roman Catholics and Protestants both agreed on the actual presence of Christ in the communion elements. Wine would not be served to the laity in communion, but baptized members of the church could receive the host, the bread, the body of Christ, from the priest. One last bit of history. In 1570, towards the end of the Renaissance, the Pius V Missal was printed and instituted as the only way to conduct a Mass and the Sacrament of Holy Communion. The Missal brought uniformity to the practices of, of the churches overseen by the Pope and the conduct of priests ordained by the Roman Catholic Church. As you can read in the bulletin notes, the Missal was written in Latin and translation into any other language was prohibited. And since only the most educated people understood Latin, most of the Catholic Mass was a mystery to the people in the pews. N next week, as we discuss communion in the Baroque period, I'm going to continue to discuss the controversy surrounding the celebration of communion. So in summary, communion in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance was guided by the doctrine of transubstantiation, that in communion, the bread and wine became the very real presence uh, uh, of the body and blood of Jesus. Eventually, during this period, 
the people would receive the host, the body of Christ, during Eucharist, but they were denied the cup. Continuing debate reared its ugly head, all because of Jesus' words at the Last Supper. Wars were fought, people were killed and, um, by those who agreed or disagreed with the doctrine of transubstantiation. Eventually, the celebration of communion was one issue that caused the Reformation and the rise of Protestant churches. Just a word about communion this morning. I know it's not my, my history period, but I want to say this. We're in communion with each other this morning as we worship together and sing together and pray together. And in that communion, we seek to remember Jesus as we come forward to receive bread and juice. Because of the discussions and the decisions made back in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, you alone, you alone can decide what the bread and juice do to help you remember Jesus and his life and death. Jesus' words at the Last Supper still ring true when he said, do all of this in remembrance of me. Do all of this in remembrance of Jesus. Amen. As I continue on here, I want you to know John and I did not talk about this this week, so you may see a theme here. This week's scripture passage in the New Testament contains arguably the most famous verse in the New Testament, John 3.16. Citation frequently seen on bumper stickers, billboards, depending on where you're traveling in the country. For all its familiarity, I've come to believe that whosoever believeth in me for humans, mostly translates to, if you think or believe like me, then you're in. Martin Luther called John 3.16 the gospel in miniature. And like any summary of the gospel, this famous sentence pushes us to clarify how we understand God's love and God's justice to be related. If we distort this key relationship of God's love and justice, we can render the verse not the gospel, but sometimes the anti-gospel, a pro proclamation not of love and invitation, but of what we've just heard of contempt and exclusion. More positively, this verse represents us with an excellent opportunity to clarify how we conceive God's love and justice and what the Christian good news is really about. Nicodemus was a learned man. He knew the scriptures. Hence, Jesus made the reference to the serpent in the wilderness, which you rem may remember from the Old Testament. Um, it comes from the book of Numbers. And in many of our sermons a few years ago, we focused on the Israelites going through the wilderness. And when we did that, we know that they had one complaint after another. And uh, Moses and God were continually, continually just trying to, to herd cats, as it were. But in this last series, and what, what Jesus refers to to Nicodemus was this. They pushed it to the limit. The people spoke against God and Moses. That's what it says in Numbers. They were hungry and impatient. The Israelites ungratefully described the exodus from Egypt. You brought us in to the wilderness to die. So God sends poisonous snakes, deadly serpents to slither among them, wreaking havoc. The people confess we have sinned and plead for help. And God directs Moses to a fashion, a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole such that any bitten Israelite can look at the serpent and live. Both in Numbers and in our Gospel of John lesson today, John 3.16, there are indications that the negative consequences described in these stories they're less divine punishments and more aspects of self-destructive nature of sin. In any case, the center of gravity in both of the stories and the key link between them is the saving action of God, as well as God's intention to save not just a select few, but everyone, the world. In the very next verse after John 3.16, Jesus goes on to say, that he sent the Son not to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The world, 
And the word for that is cosmos in the scriptures. And then finally, just one little thing. Believing in Jesus, whosoever believes in me. Who's to say what does and doesn't qualify from God's perspective as believing? Who is to say such belief can or can't emerge after death? Whether God is also other ways to redeem human communities. Whether divine forgiveness might be extended to everyone in any case. Who's to say, in other words, that God won't find a way after all to save the world that God loves? This week's passage from Genesis adds a similar note. In the call of Abraham, God's promise to bless Abraham when he leaves isn't for his sake alone or even his descendants alone. It's ultimately for everyone. The scripture said, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families. This week in a devotional, Vicki Kemper wrote um, a devotional called No Enemies. She says this, I love the idea of living in God's peace, and yet I'm pretty sure the biggest obstacles to that are not people or other people. If we hope to go through life's challenges, endure for the long haul, survive our human wounds, come out transformed on the other side, and know the realm of heaven here on earth, perhaps we need to change how we think about enemies. Some climate change organizers are working on it, proclaiming that there are no human enemies, only long-standing systems built on greed, exploitation, and domination. When we focus on our differences with other people and think of them as the enemy, we enable the very systems that are the problem. And when those of us who are on the same side even turn against one another, injustice inevitably wins. Let us not succumb to the temptation to cast our siblings, our brothers and sisters, as enemies. Remember God loved the entire world. Hearing John's words on communion today, there were differences in beliefs. How often did the church turn these into holy wars? How often do we use our beliefs to start holy wars or battles in our daily lives? In a moment, we come to the table together with many different beliefs. And quite frankly, Scarlet, You can finish it in your head. And I mean that, and John means that when he says that. Let's be true to ourselves, and through self-examination, let's try and love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, do our best to make this world that God loves and each other a better place for having been here. Amen. This is the time in our worship service where we actively and intentionally take part in the support of the ministry of Christ. If you are a member of the Little Home Church, we encourage you to continue your pledges and financial support. And if you are visiting with us today, we welcome your gifts as well. You may donate by cash, check, Venmo, PayPal. The QR codes for Venmo and PayPal are listed in the bulletin for your convenience. For those of you who may be watching this on YouTube later in the week, the information is on the screen at the close of the services. Please join me in the offertory prayer. Gracious and giving God, you have called us to give of our resources so that others may experience the new life you are inviting us into. Let our gifts be for the birthing of new life in our local community, in the global community, and in our faith community. In the name of Jesus, the Christ we pray, amen. O oh God, who calls us to go in, into the world with generosity, may these gifts call us from our lives of comfort and towards a faith journey that embraces your love, justice, and compassion for a world in need of your healing. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.
This is a season of wilderness, the season we grasp to understand the divine just a little more. This is the time for us to reach inward, to find the self that God sees. This is a chance for us to gaze outwards, caring for the Christ in our midst. On this journey, we crave the bread of life. On our desert roads, we thirst for the fruit of the vine and the cup of blessings. Through Jesus the Christ story, we remember the night before the arrest, the night of serenity, solemnity, love. Jesus took in his hands bread from the table, and he blessed it and said, Eat in remembrance of me. And after supper, as the night grew long, Jesus took a cup and filled it with the fruit of the vine, and as he blessed it, he spoke to them, Drink this in remembrance of me. For communion today, um, we have the, the bread of Hildegard von Bingen. We also have a gluten-free option, or if someone still would prefer to have the cup and the, the juice, it's there as well. And I also have um, this morning just these little Dixie cups. So if someone can't come up forward for communion, but they would like to have one of the, um, 
the special breads, just simply dip the bread in the juice, put it in the cup, and take it back to the person in the pew. Please come forward.
Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. Divine light of our journey, in a spirit of gratitude, we give thanks for this time at your holy meal, knowing that as we continue on this Latin journey, we will find your peace surrounding us. Amen. If you all stand, we're going to sing the fourth verse only of All Praise Be Yours, My God This Night by Thomas Tallis, which was the composer that the choir sang, who is from the Renaissance period. the benediction. Just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and redeem, so God sends you into the world this day to be the light and love, the healing and the hope. Go now to be light for the world and may the grace and peace of God, the creator, the redeemer, and sustainer come upon you this day and remain with you always. May the God in you See the divine image in me to which you were made and I was made, and all of the wonderful saints that will cross our paths in the days that lie ahead. Amen.